Let's study 9th standard ICSC physics, chapter 8, propagation of sound. Now, sound is a form of energy. Whenever anything vibrates, we can perceive it as sound. But how does it propagate? Let's find out. I give it some energy and it starts vibrating. So look at this wave being formed here, students. Watch it in 0 0.25 speed if you can. It is a wave called a transverse wave. Let me explain that. But before that, would you like to see a magic trick? Well, that's not how sound travels. Because sound travels as a longitudinal wave. So let's understand the difference between the two types of waves. Sound is a form of energy that produces the sensation of hearing in our ears. In our ears, we have an eardrum, which is very sensitive to vibrations, which is converted into electrical impulses, which our brain interprets as sound. Vibrating body is always a source of sound. It is definitely a form of energy because the particles of the medium actually vibrate to transfer this form of energy from one place to another. It's a form of mechanical energy. And sound needs a medium to travel. It cannot travel through a vacuum. Let's do this experiment. We have a bell jar. The vacuum pump is sucking out all the air. So what is left inside? Nothing. So it's a vacuum inside. We have this electric bell, of course, inside it. And it was turned on and we could hear the sound initially. But as the air is sucked out, we are unable to hear the sound. We can see the hammer hitting the gong continuously, but we can't hear any sound being outside the bell jar. That's because there is no medium to transfer this energy from this gong to the bell jar and outside. In between, there is vacuum. I mean, there is absence of anything out there. It's like the domino effect. If you push one domino, it creates a chain reaction and all the dominoes start falling. But what if we remove some of the dominoes in between? Then the chain reaction is broken and the further dominoes don't fall. Similarly, if there is vacuum in between, the energy is not getting transferred out. So this proves that a material medium is necessary for the propagation of sound, which is very different from light because light does not need any medium for propagation. It's a pure electromagnetic wave. That is why the sun's rays can reach the earth even though there is vacuum between the sun and the earth. Then how is it that astronauts in space or on the moon, where there is no air, are able to communicate with each other if sound cannot travel through vacuum? Think about it. Well, that's because they have space suits. They use microphones. They communicate with each other with the help of radio waves, which are also electromagnetic waves, just like light, which can travel through vacuum. So just like we speak to each other on Earth on the mobile phone using radio waves, Similarly, they too use devices to communicate with each other. And of course, inside the space suit, inside the space shuttle, there is air. So they are able to hear the sound. For sound to travel, the material medium should have two requisites or requirements. The medium must be elastic so that the particles can come back to their original position. This is true of all material medium. The medium must have inertia so that it can store mechanical energy. And it should be frictionless so that there is no loss of energy. This third point is not ideal because friction always exists everywhere. That is why sound cannot travel forever. Its intensity diminishes as the distance increases. So we hear very faint sound when we are far away from the source of the sound. And ultimately we can't even hear a sound if it's too far away. Then there are some materials which absorb sound like thick curtains, blankets, etc. That's useful in making an area soundproof or to reduce echo at a place. For example, in theatres, the walls are never smooth, they are quite rough and they use a lot of curtains, etc. And now let's understand the propagation of sound. Whenever there is a, a vibration, there is a periodic disturbance in the medium. For example, look at this metal strip, similar to the one I had used a few minutes back. Initially, it was still and the air layers around it were also still. We can't see air layers, of course, so we can just imagine this. The moment we start vibrating it, it starts oscillating. When it oscillates on the right hand side, immediately the air around it is compressed and becomes a high density region. And then when the metal strip comes back to its original position, that energy which was given to the air layers 
on its right is transferred ahead. It is similar to a ripple or ripples in a pond. When you throw a piece of stone, immediately you see ripples on the surface of the pond propagating in all directions. That's exactly what is happening here as well. Imagine this metal strip vibrating as the stone and these compressions as the crests of the ripples in air. Of course, this, is ha this happens in 3D, whereas this diagram is just, is just 2D. Next, you will notice that the vibration continues and the metal strip goes to the left. In the meanwhile, the compression, the compressed high density air with a lot of energy has already moved forward. And now there is more space or volume available for air. So the density of air decreases out here and this region is called rarefaction. And this process continues and we have alternate compressions, rarefactions, compressions, rarefactions being spread in all directions. And when this vibration of air reaches our ears, we perceive it as sound. Now understand that this was just one oscillation, which may take a fraction of a second. The truth is that oscillations may happen so fast. It can be 50 hertz or 100 hertz or even more. And that would be the frequency of sound produced. The frequency of sound depends on only one thing, the frequency of the source of sound. Such a wave is called longitudinal wave. Because if you notice the particles of the medium are vibrating left and right. As the metal strip is oscillating left and right, the particles are also moving left and right. So when the particles of the medium are vibrating in the same direction as the source of vibration, and in the same direction as the propagation of the sound, which is traveling in this direction. So they are parallel to each other. We say that this is transverse wave. Another example is, imagine you have a slinky, a long spring. And you hold one end of the spring, long spring, and you fix the other end. If you push it from one end, you will notice there will be compressions and rarefaction, compressions and rarefactions along the length of this entire spring. That is also a longitudinal wave. What's a transverse wave then? Look at the example of this pond again. If you look at the wave being produced here, what's happening is as soon as a stone hit the surface of water, they have, there were crests and troughs, crests and troughs being emitted out in all directions, which we call as ripples. So here we don't have compressions and rarefactions. Here we have the peaks and the valleys, which you can see on the surface of a pond. And you could even see such a wave motion just before I did my vanishing act of the ma magic trick. You could see that the wave was of this form. So this is a transverse wave because here the particles are moving up and down, up and down, even though the wave is moving towards the right. So when the particles of the medium vibrate or oscillate perpendicular to the direction of the wave. It is called a transverse wave. So now you know the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves. Light is a transverse wave, but light is not a mechanical wave. It, it is not made up of any particles, the light wave. It is pure energy. Although it may show a wave particle duality, but let's focus on sound right now. Another difference between transverse and longitudinal wave is that longitudinal waves are possible in all media, solid, liquid and gas. Yes, you can hear sound through solid, liquid as well as gas. In fact, sound travels fastest through solids. That is why even if you can't hear the approaching train via air, if you keep your ears touching the railway track, you will be able to hear the sound of the approaching train sooner because sound travels much faster, around 14 to 15 times faster through steel compared to through air. However, a precaution should be taken that you get out of the railway track very soon. Transverse waves, on the other hand, can travel only on the surface of liquids and in solids. So you cannot see any mechanical transverse waves inside a liquid or in a gas. Now, characteristics of wave motion. It's produced by periodic disturbance, of course, and uh, due to the propagation of wave, energy is transferred at a constant speed. Now, let's understand some terms of a wave. This is a displacement time graph. You we'll draw this. And this is a displacement distance graph. You have to draw these two diagrams. Now, imagine that this is a sound wave. Yeah, I know that this is a transverse wave and sound is not transverse. Sound is 
longitudinal. This is how sound waves should look like. But we can represent it mathematically in the form of a graph. So this is just a graph to understand some properties of the sound wave. So there are some terms we should know. The height of the peak is called the amplitude. That is the maximum displacement of the particle of the medium on either side. The maximum displacement from its mean, the middle line, the x-axis is called the mean position, the average position. So the maximum displacement from it is called the amplitude, which is measured in meter SI unit. And the time taken to complete one oscillation, so this is half an oscillation, this is another half oscillation, so that's one oscillation. The time taken for one oscillation is called time period. So imagine here it takes two seconds to complete one wave, so the time period is two seconds. Next, the number of waves per second is called frequency, which is measured in hertz or second inverse. Now, if in two seconds one wave is completed, then in one second, how many waves will be completed? Half a wave. So the frequency is half a hertz. And there is a formula to calculate it. Actually, frequency is nothing but the reciprocal of the time period. So here the time period is 2. So 1 upon 2 is half hertz or 0 0.5 hertz. The reverse is also true. The time period is equal to 1 upon f. They are reciprocals of each other. And remember, the frequency does not depend on the amplitude or the nature of the medium. So if I were to hit that metal strip very hard, still the frequency would not have changed. Only the amplitude would have changed. That is, it would have been louder. The sound would have been louder. The loudness of sound depends on amplitude. The loudness does not depend on frequency. Also, if the medium was changed from air to water, still the frequency of sound remains the same. Frequency doesn't change. The speed may change, the loudness may change, but not the frequency. Even the wavelength can change. What's that? Well, in a displacement distance graph, there's no time here, there's distance. Here there was time. Here the amplitude is, of course, a maximum displacement, but now the length of one complete wave or the distance traveled by the wave in one time period is called wavelength, which is uh, symbolized by lambda, and its SI unit is meter. But the wavelength does depend on the medium through which it passes. So you can also say that wavelength is a distance between two successive or consecutive uh, crests or two consecutive troughs. In an actual sound wave, you could say that the wavelength is a distance between two consecutive compressions. If we have a compression here, then very fraction. And another compression here, then the distance between these two compressions is called wavelength. Graphically, the compressions are shown as the crests and the rarefactions, that is a region of low pressure, low density of air, is shown by troughs. And finally, wave velocity. Well, it's the velocity of the wave, that is the distance traveled by the wave in one second. And its SI unit is meter per second. The speed of a wave, that is the speed of sound, depends on a few factors like elasticity and density of the medium. Elasticity and density. These are two things which affect the speed of wave in a medium. Now, what's the relationship between the wavelength, wave velocity, and frequency? We know that uh, wavelength is nothing but the distance traveled in one time period. And distance is equal to velocity into time. Distance is equal to velocity into time. So if you substitute the values, I'm saying lambda is equal to velocity into time. And here time means time period. That is the time for one wave. We're focusing on one wave right now. But we know the time period is nothing but the reciprocal of frequency. So if I substitute that and rearrange the terms, I get the formula that velocity is equal to frequency into wavelength. Now that's something we will use in numericals. Velocity is equal to frequency into wavelength. Speed of sound in a medium depends on two factors, two major factors, elasticity and density of the medium. Elasticity, as you know, is uh, the ability of the particles to come back to their original position. Because, you know, when a wave is transferred, only the energy is actually getting transferred. The particles come back to their original position. So, surprisingly, when this, these ripples are moving, you know, the water molecules are just bobbing up and down. The water molecules are not going anywhere. They're not going towards bank. It's not like a sea wave. In a sea wave, there the waves actually move ahead and they wet your feet and even the beach sand. But these are ripples on the pond surface. Here, you see the ripples stretching outward you see the circles growing bigger and bigger but the truth is the water molecules are not moving far away it's just that the water molecules are going up and down up and down and transferring the energy to the next one and then to the next one like a domino effect a chain reaction 
Now let's study the factors affecting speed of sound in a gas in further detail. So in a gas there are four factors now. First is the density. The speed of sound is inversely proportional to square root of density. It simply means that if the air is denser, speed of sound is lesser. Effect of temperature. Well, as the temperature of a gas increases, you can imagine that the density will decrease because gases expand on being heated. And if the density decreases, obviously the speed of sound will increase. So again, the speed of sound is directly proportional to the square root of the temperature. But here the temperature is in Kelvin scale. We have no numericals based on this formula. We just have to know what is the effect of temperature. It is observed that whenever there is a temperature rise of even 1 degree Celsius, the speed of sound increases by 0 0.61 meters per second. For example, at 0 degree Celsius, the speed of sound is roughly 330 meters per second. So at 25 degree Celsius, on calculating, it comes up to 345.25 meters per second. Again, such numericals won't come in exam, but you need to know this. Next, effect of humidity. Now, this is something surprising. Which is denser, moist air or dry air? Well, dry air surprisingly is denser. Moisture has less density than air. Water vapor's density is less than that of oxygen, nitrogen combined. So that means humid air being less dense will have higher speed of sound through it. So that's a good reason here. And finally, effect of direction of wind, which is, well, common sense. If you're speaking in a direction such that the wind is blowing in the same direction as the sound is traveling, then the blowing wind will increase the speed of sound. So if this is you, you're speaking and wind is blowing in the same direction. So the speed of sound will increase. On the other hand, if the wind was blowing in the opposite direction, yeah, don't admire the face I've drawn. If the wind is blowing in the opposite direction, then the speed of sound will decrease. And the final speed is always either the addition of the two velocities or the subtraction of the two velocities. Factors not affecting the speed of sound. Effect of pressure. Remember, air pressure will not affect the speed of sound due to reasons you need not know right now. Effect of amplitude. Amplitude affects how loud a sound is. It does not affect the speed of sound. If you yell, still the speed of sound will be same, 330 meters per second at zero degree Celsius. Effect of wavelength or frequency. No, they don't affect the speed of sound. Here we have a difference between the speed of sound and the speed of light. There are many differences. First of all, light can travel in vacuum, sound cannot. Light travels super fast, 3 to 10 raised to 8 meters per second is the fastest thing in the universe. Nothing can travel as fast as this or faster than this. Sound is very slow. And you realize this. That's why when you see lightning, you hear the thunder after a few seconds because the light from the lightning reaches your eyes almost instantaneously. But sound takes a few seconds to reach your ears. And that is also the reason why sometimes when you look at a person, they look brilliant. But only after they start speaking, you realize how dumb they are. And another difference is that light, light waves are transverse waves and uh, they're electromagnetic waves. Whereas sound is a longitudinal wave and a mechanical wave, which means that they need particles of the medium for their propagation. Another good reason is that often when you're watching a cricket game in the stadium, you can see the batsman making a stroke, like a, a cover drive, or a cut above point and you hear the sound of contact between the bat and ball after a couple of seconds because velocity of light is much greater than velocity of sound. So there's an experimental determination of uh, speed of sound in air which is not very important but just for your knowledge all you have to do is uh, you can go to a mountain shoot in the air and ask your friend on another mountain far away to start the stopwatch when they see the smoke coming out from the gun and stop the stopwatch when they hear the sound of the gun. Yeah, you have to use a smoke gun, obviously. Only then it will be visible. The distance between the two mountains can be found out with the help of Google Maps. And the time has been recorded in the watch. Speed is equal to distance upon time. Infrasonic, sonic and ultrasonic frequencies. The human ear is capable of hearing sound in the range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. That's the audible range of frequency. Less than 20 hertz, we can't hear. More than 20,000 hertz also, we can't hear. And this is also approximate. It depends on from person to person as well. For example, I can hear only till 16,000 hertz. Now, this does not denote loudness of the sound. Don't think that frequency has anything to do with loudness. It's, it's just the pitch of the sound. High-pitched and low-pitched sound.
That's why we can't hear the pendulum swinging. You know, the pendulum swings with a frequency of around half a hertz, which is uh, very low for us to hear, not because of the loudness or anything. And there are some frequencies greater than 20,000 hertz. There are whistles which produce sound with more frequency, and dogs respond to them. It's called a dog whistle. They come to you when you blow that whistle, but you can't hear that sound because dogs are more sensitive as far as hearing is concerned. Many animals are more sensitive than human beings. So you can do your frequency test here. You can see right now you can't hear much. But as the frequency is increasing, so you will be able to hear it if your hearing is not impaired. audibility range is it to 20,000 hertz or less than that so frequencies less than 20 hertz are called uh, infrasonic more than 20,000 hertz are called ultrasonic and in between 20 and 20,000 hertz is called uh, sonic that is audible sound animals such as elephants and whales can listen to infrasonic sounds and dolphins can hear ultrasonic sounds. Even bats can hear ultrasonic sounds. That is why they can use it to avoid obstacles in their path. Ultrasound is very useful. It has some unique properties. The energy carried by them is very high and they always travel along a well-defined straight path, just like a laser. So how do bats avoid obstacles? Well, let me try to draw a bat here. It produces ultrasound. We can't hear it. If there is an obstacle out here, then it will reflect the sound. They hear it, they calculate the time period between transmitting and receiving the sound and they know the speed of sound is 330 meters per second. They use the formula they've learned in their schooling days, speed is equal to distance upon time to calculate the distance of the object from them. That's how they can avoid the obstacle or if they perceive that there is a prey out here then they will attack it and eat it. So that's the same principle being used in our ultrasound devices. So nature is an inspiration for engineers. We can use ultrasound to detect defects in metals because ultrasound will pass through the object if there is no defect, such as a crack or a cavity. But if there is a defect, then a part of it will be reflected which will be noticed by the machines. So now ultrasonography or just sonography is also used to find get images of human organs, especially in pregnancy. We can uh, check out the fetus with the help of sonography. X-rays should be avoided because radiation may be harmful, whereas sonography is safe. If it's used to get the image of a heart, it's called echocardiography. Sonar, which is sound navigation and ranging, is used to detect ocean bed or to detect a submarine underneath. Difference between ultrasonic and supersonic is, ultrasonic means sound whose frequency is above 20,000 hertz. And supersonic means any object which is traveling at greater than speed of sound in air. For example, there are many jet planes and fighter planes which travel at a greater speed than 330 meters per second. So they are called supersonic objects. Even Iron Man can fly at greater than Mach 1, which is greater than the speed of sound, due to which there is a sonic boom. So this is how a sonar works. The transmitter transmits ultrasound, obstacle will reflect it, receiver will receive it, time is calculated by the computer chip, and the distance is calculated. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.